meant to say when Jesus stood there and called Lazarus from the tomb and he came out alive. I believe the reason he had to say the name of Lazarus was if it wasn't, every tomb would have been <laughs> People would have come alive. And remember, God says he knows you by name. So when he calls us to that great day of resurrection, it's by name. Amen. So good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with you this morning. Um, bless you for the worship, the worship group, and also for the uh, prayer which came over here for our fathers. Mm. This nation so desperately needs strong fathers and strong families yeah. and strong mothers as well. So do pray for the families and do pray for fathers next week. It's a very difficult job in the society raising children so much peer pressure. Yeah. And also bless you for the prayers for Israel. As you may know, it's the 75th year anniversary of the founding of the nation state of Israel. And before I get on to my message, if I can just give you a very brief overview of the whole Bible. If you look at the whole Bible, if you look at Genesis chapter 1 and 2, you see how it makes no apology for God. The very first verse states as a fact, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then you see a picture of how God created such a beautiful and such a good creation. And man and woman lived in full fellowship and harmony with him. And then in Genesis chapter 3, you see how sin came into the picture. And that beautiful harmony between humanity and God was broken. And all the way from Genesis 3 up to Genesis 11, you see the rise of human civilizations and you see how it descends into absolute chaos and sin to such a degree that God even at one point said, I grieve that I've even made this creation because of what a mess they've done with the free will that I've given to them. And then from Genesis chapter 12 all the way to Malachi, you see how God starts to reintroduce himself specifically to the world. He calls a man called Abraham and he says many promises to him that from you and your descendants I will bless this world. And we see how God formed the nation of Israel, their trials and tribulations, their cycles of obedience and disobedience to God, all the way throughout the Old Testament. But God always promised that one day somebody is going to come, a Saviour, a Messiah, who will be Emmanuel, God, with us. And so we see, we just recap from Genesis 1 to 2, we see that redemption was not needed. And that word redemption means deliverance from slavery. We see from Genesis 3 to 11 how humanity became in the grip of the slavery of sin. A rebellion towards God. And we see all the way from Genesis 11 to Malachi how God promises that one day I'm going to deliver people from this bondage to sin. And then we see the four Gospels that Jesus arrives on the scene. And we see how Jesus accomplished that redemption through his life, his death, his resurrection and his ascension. And then we see in the epistles, and this is important, we see in the epistles, the letters of the apostles, how that redemption is explained. And that's important because in this day and age, you hear it increasingly so, even in Christian churches, it's always been around, but it's actually growing in this day and age, where people say that we want to go back to the teaching of Jesus and dismiss the apostle Paul, who twisted Christianity. But what you actually see is that Jesus commissioned the Apostle Paul to teach and explain exactly what it meant on the cross, both for Jewish people and also for the rest of the entire world. And it's ideologically convenient for certain Christians today to want to dismiss Paul because of some of the things he said. But then, in the book of Revelation, that wonderful vision that the Apostle John had you see how everything that happened in Genesis is reversed. I'm not going to go through it all, but you can see step by step 
how the book of Revelation promises that everything went wrong, in the end, God will redeem it. And the reason I say this is because, and I'm not talking, this is not really my message, I'm just giving a bit of an introduction. The reason I'm sharing this is because the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost said, these are the last days. The Bible doesn't use the term end times. We do as Christians, which means the last of the last days. There's four signs that Jesus said would happen before he returns. There'll be signs in the world. There'll be increasing divisions amongst people, nations, and ethnic groups. There'll be signs in the kingdom, in the church, that the church will become riddled with doctrines of demons, even denying the very Lord who redeemed them. There'll be signs in the sky, great cosmological events that will happen. That's why I don't think believe Jesus is coming back tonight. That sign still has to be fulfilled. And then the fourth sign will be a dictator rising in the Middle East who will appear in Israel. And the Bible clearly teaches these things. It teaches that one day God would bring the Jewish people back to their homeland. If you listen to the Victorian preachers, there were certain preachers in that day and age who were predicting, the Bible says that one day the Jewish people will come back into their homeland. But others were saying that's impossible. How can it ever happen, all the political events? It happened before I was born. Those of you who were over 75 have lived for it when the Jewish people came back to their homeland. And the Bible teaches that they would come back in unbelief. And that's why Israel is currently a secular nation. But the Bible also talks about a day will come when actually the blindness and the scales over the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham, to whom God made so many promises, that will be lifted and suddenly they will recognise the one whom they pierced. And it's so important we pray for Israel because certainly in America and also in this country they're losing a lot of friends. I'm surprised even at the growing anti-Semitism in some Christian churches in this nation and the anti zionism and so forth. And so do continue to pray for the nation of Israel. It's part of God's plan. But I want to come on to the text I've been asked to speak about this morning. I want to give you three things because as we look at the raising of Lazarus, there's literally hundreds of sermons. You could have a hundred different preachers come up here this morning and they could all give a different sermon bringing the truth and the truths out of these scriptures, these verses. So I just want to focus your mind on three things this morning. And the first is the power of Jesus, the indestructible, unending, life eternal power of Jesus. The second thing I will draw your attention to him is the emotion of Jesus. And you'll be surprised because I won't just be focusing on the weeping part. You'll see how actually he became enraged, quite angry in this passage. And the third thing I want to focus on is the call of Jesus to each and every person. In 1735, if you know your church history, John Wesley, who eventually became the founder of the Methodist denomination, he and his brother were travelling to the North Americas to become missionaries to the North American Indians. And all of a sudden, a great storm arose, and everybody on the ship started to scream in terror. The waves were literally crashing over the side and they thought the ship were going to sink. Even Wesley and his brother were terrified and everybody else, apart from one small group of people, and they were called the Moravian Brethren. And they stood on that ship, the men, the women, even their little children, and they just praised God. They started worshipping God. And Wesley said there was such a peace among these people and he was watching the contrast. They were seeing some people screaming in terror and these other people who had just such a peace about them. Unfortunately, the storm abated and the ship was safe. 
And Wesley went up to him afterwards and he said, why or how could you have such peace? And they explained to him the teaching of justification by faith in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And John Wesley didn't really understand it for three years. He went to become a missionary to the North American Indians and he actually found, he admits himself, that his mission was just a complete failure. But when he came back to England, he went to a church in Eldersgate in London, and there he heard the preacher just talking about Luther's commentary to the Book of Romans and justification by faith. And Wesley said that all of a sudden his heart was strangely warmed. He was born again, he suddenly understood the reality of the kingdom of God. When we focus on Jesus, every word spoken by him is full of deep instruction for us as Christians. It's the voice of the chief shepherd. It's the great head of the church speaking to his members. It's the master of the house speaking to his servants. It's the captain of our salvation speaking to his soldiers. It's the voice of him who said, I have not spoken of myself. The Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment that I should say and what I should speak. And so the teaching of Jesus holds great value on every topic. His parables and prophecies are precious and we would do well to study them. His words of comfort and consolation are of great value. And serious are his warnings and cautions. When Jesus tells us to be wary or be cautious of something, we would do well to pay heed to that. And amazing are his miracles and his deeds. You've been looking at the 7 a.m. statements of Jesus. So, so far, you would have looked at, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And this morning, we're going to look at, I am the resurrection and the life. And then in the last two, you will look, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. When Jesus said, I am, he said that. Our task as the church is now to say he is. When he says, I am the resurrection and the life, our calling is to say he is the resurrection and the life. During his earthly ministry, Jesus raised three people back to life from the dead. They were Jairus' daughter, they were a widow's son, and the third one was Lazarus, who's in our text this morning. So there's always five helpful questions to ask whenever you look at any passage of scripture. The first one is where? Where was Jesus saying this? The second one is who? Who was he speaking to? The third thing is what? What exactly was Jesus saying? And the fourth thing was when was he saying it? And the fifth thing was why was he saying it? And you don't have to ask them necessarily in that order, but they're good questions to ask. And if we ask where was Jesus saying this? He was saying this at Bethany, two miles away from Jerusalem, which was a very dangerous place for him to go. His disciples had actually warned him, if you read the whole of that chapter, don't go there because they're trying to kill you, they're trying to stone you. And good old Thomas always doubted when Jesus said, we're going anyway, well let's just go to Bethany and die now. Look at it, it's out there in the passage. The man who was, became a great apostle, but always the man who was always looking on the negative, always thinking that um, you know, things were going to go wrong because he didn't fully trust what Jesus Christ said. And that's part of what I would like to show you this morning, is when you understand truly what Jesus said, we can have total faith and confidence in him. I have tried to make a decision. And when I say try, because we're human, but I want to live a fearless life. I want to live a life where I'm not afraid of the things God tells me not to be afraid of but to have total faith and confidence in the things God tells me to be confident in. And he tells us to be confident in who Jesus is. So who was Jesus speaking to when he said, I am the resurrection and the life? Well, he was speaking directly to Martha when he said those words. And the disciples were also listening. 
And so both sisters speak to Jesus prior to the miracle, and both had the same sorrowful complaint, if you had been here, which is another way of saying, if you'd have got here earlier, Lord, our brother would still be alive. There's a hint of accusation in it, that actually you've let us down. Martha said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And she thought he meant in the resurrection at the last day. And it was then that Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And when he was saying that, he was making two statements. The first, he was making a statement about his divine nature, that he is the very source of all life. And the second is that he has complete and utter total power over death. When we think of Genesis 1-1, the God who created all things, the epistles, Paul tells us that in his letter to the Colossians, he tells us that's who Jesus is, that Jesus literally is God incarnate. The God who created and sustains all things appeared on this earth in human form. And so he said back to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And then Mary was at home being comforted by other Jewish mourners. And Martha went and told Mary, her sister, and said, Jesus the teacher is here. So she's followed by others and she rushes out to see him. And she says the same thing. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when you read the rest of that text, if you read verses 33 to 38, it says Jesus was deeply troubled. Now the Greek word there, I'm not one of these who always goes into a Greek lesson every time I preach, but sometimes it is important to actually draw out the meaning of the original language. And the Greek there is embry myomai, which, if used in a certain context, means a horse snorting. But when used in a human context, when explaining that a human being is feeling like that, it's talking about absolute outrage, absolute anger. And so when Jesus says to them to take them up to the tomb, the translations in English, I think they tame it just a little bit too much, because it says Jesus was going to the tomb absolutely angry and absolutely outraged. And you think, why? Why was Jesus going there? And the thing is, who was he angry at? Was he angry at Mary and Martha? No, because the text in the first part of that chapter says he loved them. It says he loved Mary, he loved Martha, he loved Lazarus. Was he angry at the professional mourners? In a, that day and age, we'd always hire professional mourners who wouldn't really be mourning, they'd just be playing their harps and lyres and crying and weeping and wailing, but there was no genuine sincerity there. It was just a, a public thing. Was he angry at them? No, he wasn't. The text is telling us it was death itself that Jesus was angry with. That this man whom he loved, death had taken him. Now if you're following on with the text, you'll be thinking, well hold on, if that's the case, why did Jesus wait then four days before he actually got there to Bethany? Why did he go straight away? And there is a very good reason for that. Because in the culture at the time, when somebody died, the superstition was that for three days the spirit would stay by the body. Even when they put the body in the tomb, the spirit would stay by the body. But if it didn't come back into the body after three days, now this isn't science, this isn't the Bible, I'm just talking about this is the superstitious culture of the day. But if after three days that hadn't happened, the spirit would go to be with God. And so Jesus purposely waited till the fourth day. And you'll notice in the text he says that I waited so that the glory of God could be revealed, etc. He waited till the fourth day so there could be not one single doubt about Lazarus had gone. 
His body was dead there in the tomb. His spirit was nowhere present in that vicinity. Jesus was making that very powerful <laughs> statement. I think that's an important lesson to learn there. When we ask God, Lord, why are you delaying? Mary and Martha had that very question, God, Jesus, why didn't you come a couple of days earlier? If you had, our brother would still be alive. I guarantee, I certainly have asked it in my Christian life at times, although I've learned not to ask it now, but just to wait on the Lord. But if you had times when you've asked, Lord, why aren't you acting now? Why aren't you doing something now? Why the delay? And what I want to say to you is the timing of God is always perfect. There's always a reason for every delay. That's why the Bible calls us to be a patient people, to wait patiently for the Lord to act. Because God knows exactly the right time to act. And sometimes when People think, feel that God seems inactive, they become disappointed, discouraged, confused, they start to have doubt, guilt, anger, and fear. But actually remember that God is never inactive. God is always working, even behind the scenes, sometimes when we cannot perceive what he's doing, Christ, God, is still working on our behalf. We heard the scripture earlier from Romans, and Romans 8, 28 said, but all things work for the good of those who love God and have been, according, uh, have been called according to his purpose. If we believe that, we can have patience even when it seems okay. It seems like God's not working, but actually behind the scenes, God is bringing everything together. We mentioned Israel at the beginning for centuries, the Jewish people are crying out, God, when will you bring us back to our homeland? Through both exiles, I'm not going to go into the Old Testament uh, exile, but through both exiles for centuries, they were saying, next year in Jerusalem. But it took centuries for it to happen. Was God being an active? No, he was being the God of the nation, shaping the political events, shaping all of the events to bring the possibilities to bring the Jewish people back to their homeland. If God can do that for the nations, how much can he do for the little old you and me? How much more can he work all circumstances for our good? And as I say, Jesus was enraged at death. We think of this on the human level, this miracle, but actually it was happening on two levels. God was proving something to the unseen realms as well as human beings. Don't we read from Paul when he says that if the dark powers that be had realised what God's power was in Jesus Christ, they would never have crucified him. They couldn't perceive what God was doing. And here, before Jesus himself was crucified and resurrected, here we are seeing him demonstrate both to the heavenly realms and also to those present that he has complete and utter and total control over death. That's why those Moravian Christians, they understood who Jesus was. They understood him when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And if Jesus asked that last question this morning, the same question, he asked Mary and Martha, do you really believe? If we say yes, we can have complete confidence and peace in any and every situation. This is not an arrogant statement I now make, it's a very humble one, full of humility. I do not believe that I can die until I have fulfilled my God-given destiny in this world. <laughs> Why? Because I'm not saying to God, my will be done. Lord, I'll keep you in my back pocket when I need you. I'll just go on with my life and if I suddenly need you, I call upon you. No, my prayer from my heart always is, Lord, your will be done. You've promised your Holy Spirit will lead me. You've promised your Holy Spirit will guide, will teach. I want your will to be done. 
You've called me for a purpose in this world, and I want that to be manifested and to be fulfilled. And so therefore, I'm confident, make sure that no lights about to fall on my head as I say this. <laughs> therefore I'm confident, as I say, that he who holds the power of life and death holds each and every one of us in his hands. <coughs> this is why as Christians can have absolute confidence. Because when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, I'm sure you've already covered what that means from Exodus 3, um, chapter 3, when God introduced himself as the I am to Moses in the burning bush, which really means I am the one who exists, I am the one who is all life and all things. And Jesus was saying the same thing here. Jesus was claiming to be the source of both the resurrection and the life. And it's interesting because a lot of people, even Christians, they have, I did a teaching series some time ago, and it was a three part teaching series, justification, sanctification, and glorification. The justification part, where we looked at what it means to be justified solely by faith in Jesus. That when we trust in him, God gives us his grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. We are given eternal life, we are saved. And then the sanctification process. How when we receive Jesus as a saviour, he also becomes our Lord. But a lot of people never walk with him as Lord. Some people want the same with it, but they then don't want the following him as Lord bit, which is the sanctification process. Where God takes our lives, he cleans our hearts up, he adjusts our minds so that we can be renewed in our minds, understanding what the full purpose and will of God is. And then there was the glorification part. And the reason I mention that was because the most popular two of those talks were the justification and the glorification. People didn't really like the bit in between because that's the work. And somebody said to me recently, he's a Christian who's been a Christian for about 10 years and goes to a church in a, a, a town nearby. And he said, I don't know if I was to die today, what would happen? I said, well, the Bible is very clear about it, if you actually look about it. The Bible talks about to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This body can die, but our spirit, if we are born again Christians, is already alive in Christ. We already have eternal life. It cannot die because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. So I explained to him, when you die, your physical body may die, your spirit goes to be with God, and it's awaiting the day when Jesus returns, when the dead in him will rise. And that heaven is not just some spiritual ghostly place where it all floats about. The Bible talks about heaven will be very similar to this earth, the new heaven and the new earth. We will have a physical body like Jesus has. There will be a creation where the Apostle Paul says, no mind has yet conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. He said, no ear has heard it. No preacher has adequately explained what the eternal kingdom of God will be like. But he says that God has given us a taste of it by his Holy Spirit. That's why when I'm worshipping, as I was worshipping there this morning, I felt the presence of God and I felt tears come into my eyes. Because I thought again, I'm having a taste of heaven, a taste of what it's like to be in the presence of God. And so Jesus was absolutely furious at death. Why? Because it was never part of his plan. It came as an enemy into this world. That's why the apostles and everybody says, talks about death as an enemy. One day, if Jesus tarries, the power rider on the power horse, the one the Bible metaphorically calls death, will come galloping towards each and every one of us. But if we understand who Jesus is, we can look him in the face and we can say, death, where is thy victory? Death. Where is thy sting? Because Christ has conquered you. And my death, if it be that of the physical body, is only temporary until Christ returns. Because he is 
the resurrection and the life. Amen. I'll just make these few closing statements. Jesus was making a statement concerning his divine nature. I'm sure you understand the sovereignty of God. If you really do, you realise that despite what's happening in this nation, the godlessness and all of the stuff happening in Western civilization as a whole, you still recognise that God actually has a purpose and a plan. God is still in control. In fact, if you look at Romans chapter 1, he says to human societies that just want to say, we're not interested in you. We want to live how we want, do what we want. It says that God actually takes his hands off and says, there you go then, go for it. But there will be consequences to that which come into your society. And you see that in Romans 1. And so even when a society has brought judgment upon itself, not that God is directly judging it, the judgment is, but the consequences of their actions are causing chaos. Even in that, God is raising up people to preach the gospel of grace, to preach people who will come to him. I will close with that. There's so much more I could say. Please don't groan. <laughs> Just about to close. But as I say, understand the power of Jesus, who is God in the flesh when he walks amongst us, who is here present now by his Holy Spirit. Understand the emotion of Jesus. He was outraged by death. He was angry that it was destroying his creation. And he was making a point to the heavenly realms and to human beings about he had power over it. And that's why he submitted himself to death and overcame it through the resurrection. And also the verse Jesus wept, he does sympathise with us when we ourselves are grieving over those we lost. But he calls us to live with him, to not be afraid of death or this life. But Romans 8, 8 chapter of Romans, Read it again later if you get the chance. But Paul says, I'm not afraid of these things. But I'm convinced that nothing in all creation can separate, separate me from the love that is shown in Jesus Christ. And God bless you. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He said it. We believe it. We proclaim it. Amen. Amen. Amen.